Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael in this afternoon for Judy Simpson. Well, the days are obviously getting longer. The temperatures are beginning, we think, to get warmer, which means gardening season is getting closer. Now, one of the best ways to get ideas on new varieties or what to plant is with a garden visit. So this afternoon, we're going to do some garden visits to the nearby Hudson Valley of New York State. And joining me is our frequent contributor from UVM Extension, Dr. Leonard Perry. Welcome. Always great to see you. It's always great to be back, Will. We think the weather's getting warmer. Well, yeah, well, I think I think it is, actually. Okay. You know, it's well, not below zero anymore, we, so that's good. <laughs> now, you, today you brought along some gorgeous pictures to share with us. You're also going to tell us about a special tour that you're going to have later this summer. But let's start, where is our tour starting today? Okay, as you mentioned, well, each year I have a tour, and I do an overnight tour uh, sometime in midsummer in collaboration with the King's Garden at Fort Ticonderoga. Now, it's either one or two overnights. Last year we had an overnight tour to the Hudson Valley of New York. There's all kinds of great gardens there. Uh, we'll just take a look at a sampling today from our tour. So this and is where we're going to start. We'll the start here, the and Hudson this is Valley. actually Locust Grove. It's near Poughkeepsie, and it, you see why a lot of these were popular. That's the Hudson River and the views of it, it's just very beautiful. But this is the home of Samuel Morse, inventor of the Telegraph. And he had some beautiful gardens, very Victorian era. Um, this is actually something, again, you can get these ideas. You don't have to have a bed like this, but you can just plant some zinnias and blue salvia. Just a small combination in a, a barrel or planter and get that same effect as here at Locust Grove in the Hudson Valley. Um, but again, Victorian style garden, one of the things they had was a lot of big foliage and leafy things and fountains. And this is a very good example. A lot of landscape trees too here at Locust Grove. And um, again, some uh, plantings here, some newer varieties, some historic varieties. This is a, a relative, actually, of the poinsettia, the, the white leaves there, the euphorbia, snow on the mountain or snow in the summer, it's called. Interplanting, this is something I like to do. We tried it, in fact, at home this year. It worked great. This tall verbena, this tall vervain, it's those little uh, purplish flowers that you interplant and then it comes up above it and creates that very fine texture. So again, an idea, plant combination, people could try at home. Uh, this summer. And then this is interesting. It's a little tunnel arch. You see the people walking through it here, and it's a hardy, variegated kiwi vine. So, yeah, that is hardy. People can grow it around here. It has these variegated leaves, but again, that very lush Victorian uh, kind of thing. And then uh, the second historic home brought pictures of is Belfield, and <clears throat> this is a uh, garden, one of the few left of the famous designer Beatrix Fair. Now this is near Hyde Park, and it's right adjacent to the Rockefellers, um, or, or the uh, Roosevelt's um, estate. But this, uh, Beatrix Fair was one of the the first women landscape architects, the late 1800s, early 1900s. She was a founder of the American Society for Landscape Architects, the first woman. She did some famous properties like the White House, uh, campuses like Yale and Princeton. She was pretty famous. Um, but this is one of the few remaining gardens, and they've really restored this. And you can see she has color themes. Here we have hibiscus, some is still be on the left, but pinks and then different other uh, monochromatic, if you will, uh, color combinations textural combinations here, like the lamb's ears uh, kind of spilling over this walk, the, the very soft foliage contrasted with the yucca there, the very upright. So again, just a combination people could do if you have a path, have those perennials spill over. Some white flowers here. Um, the Tennessee, the, the fever few, the Cleome, the spider flower, that's a great one. So again, all whites and then another white combination, Cosmos, again, that spider flower and, and some perennial flocks. Mm -hmm. So combining the annuals with the perennials um, to keep, you know, when the flocks aren't in bloom, you have those white annuals kind of carrying you through the season. So again, good combinations. They're from a famous designer. Well, plants and combinations. Exactly. Uh, and I love a, a couple of anecdotes, the relation to the poinsettia. That was neat because in the winter, you and I have done programming and talk a lot about the poinsettia, understanding things like that. Uh, very cool. Now, that's just one place. Uh, was there a, a, a favorite of yours or of the garden tour? Uh, 
the folks on the tour who were with you? Was there yeah, a favorite? Well, I think a lot of people like, you know, there are a lot of plant kind of people that really enjoy plants come on these tours. And um, there was a place we visited, Stone Crop, which had lots of great plants. And uh, this is south of Fishkill, and it was the home of Frank Cabot, who actually founded the Garden Conservancy. He also has a very famous property. Uh, he's uh, written a book, uh, Le Catravon, The Four Winds Up North of Quebec City. That was another home he had. But this is a uh, one you can visit, and we visited, and that's a giant rhubarb, the gunnera. It has to have protection in winter, even down in the Hudson Valley which is a bit warmer than Vermont. Beautiful conservatory there where they overwinter a lot of these plants. And they, it's interesting here, they put a lot of tender perennials, like those spiky plants there, they're kind of orange. That's a New Zealand flax. Formium, it, it's one I have, have to overwinter inside. They do the same, but then they put it out in the garden for that textural effect. You think it's growing there, but no, it's a tender plant. It's just put in there along with the daylilies that are hardy and just a whole host of bronze fennel in the front. So again, kind of the orangey, warm colors in, in that bed there at uh, Stone Crop. A uh, lot of alpines, rock garden plants, troughs like this. Again, container gardening's popular now. You could do this. A beautiful a little companion there, bellflower, alpine version in the front. Um, and then all kinds of other gardens. Here's one that's very tropical feel to it with all kinds of foliage and weeping things, a pond, a stone bridge. Uh, just a lot of interesting plant material, interesting sculptures and things. Here's a frog sitting in a gazebo, perched out on the pond. You can go sit and get your picture with the frog. But beautiful sculptural and, and you know hardscape uh, things in the garden. And here's something That's interesting. Fun. This is an interesting scarecrow. It's actually. Uh, 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 patterned after a f another famous designer, Gertrude Jekyll, who was an English, uh, probably people at Garden and do perennials may know that name. She's the one that really kind of popularized the perennial borders that we have today over in England, Victorian era. She wrote many books, and so Gertrude Jekyll, Scarecrow, is what they created in their garden, which was really fun. And I should remember <laughs> who wrote Paddington the Bear. Honestly, it reminded me of Paddington. When you yep. said English, I'm thinking, Maybe that's what that is. And the ponds, just anyway, gorgeous yeah, stuff. Yeah, a lot of so, variation there, yeah. So that's Stone Crop near Fishkill. Pretty easy to see yeah. why some <laughs> of your folks along on the tour picked that as their favorite. Now, you've noted this was only a sampling of, of gardens in the Hudson Valley. Have you seen others in that area? I have, have well, uh, a lot of these times with these tours, and, and like this last one, I went down and checked out some others and, um, and then brought some pictures of those. Just again, to give a, two or three more, some very different ones. Um, starting with one, they're called Copal, which, um, and you can see the aerial view wow. uh, from a photograph you were up near in a Garrison. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't there. I took this from just, uh, yeah. you can tell yeah. perhaps from like a uh, picture they yes. had there. So it's you can beautiful. see the overview of the formal. It's basically a house, again, on a Hudson. And they basically have three gardens. This is kind of the formal rose garden we'll see from the ground. But they also have an edible garden, a beautiful structure here with, they have all kinds of apples and herbs and grapes and edible plants totally. In this garden, they have a small orchard there. And then this is that rose garden from the ground looking out over the, right Hudson. over the Hudson. Now, if you've ever heard of West Point, most people have. That's just right across the Hudson here behind those hedges. So it gives you a feel of where this garden is and you can sit out there and they have, if you ever can get down to it, they have a wonderful audio tour uh, that you take around. You can put on the headphones and, and choose what you want to hear, a little segments about the environment there, about the history. It's just a really nice place, Boscopal. And then a very different garden. <clears throat> this is kind of east a little bit, uh, slightly, Millbrook of Poughkeepsie. This is uh, regarded by many as one of the, among the top gardens in the world. It's very Asian inspired. It goes with the landscape, uh, using like here the rock, rock outcroppings, the water, um, and then the plantings to enhance that and go with it. Here's just a beautiful, you know, detail. If you look at the stone there, it, it's, you know, it's just very artistic the way that's done. So again, this is Ennis Free Gardens, and here you see it almost looks like a ruins. It, you know, to help hold that hillside, they rather than just to build a stone wall, they've done this, had plantings, that climbing hydrangea on the right coming into bloom. Uh, these were taken back, you know, in, in the early part of summer, these pictures. So again, the very beautiful. And then the other thing wow. you get to see on these is some different plants you may not see around here, like the weeping larch. Japanese maples generally aren't hardy in most of Vermont, but in the Hudson Valley, you can see them like this red cut leaf Japanese maple. So you get to see a lot of plants and learn some that, that you don't normally have. Purple beech is another one that's very marginal. This is a weeping form on the right. Clematis on the left, of course, we can grow in a water feature here. So 
Uh, just some examples um, of from there and then a pond they have looking out at Innisfree. Now this again is very natural, Asian inspired, up the road about half hour uh, on top of a hill with beautiful views as Weathersfield. This again was an estate, um, but look at that. I mean that's very formal and just totally opposite. It's such a, you know, kind of two ends of the spectrum, uh, taking advantage, you know, of the views there and with the, um, you know, different uh, balustrades and, and all kinds of hardscaping there and those uh, hedges pruned upright, very formal too, to kind of go with it. Pots like the gardenia on the left brought out from their greenhouse to be out on these areas in the summer. A Grecian temple with the hostess line, again, very formal lines compared to the curved lines of Innisfree. Peacocks like you see over in gardens abroad in England, uh, wandering around, squawking and looking beautiful. So that's kind of fun when you round a corner and see one of those. And again, a little reflecting pool, a little water coming out into that. Again, very formal lines, that huge hedge, maybe 15, 20 feet tall on both sides in the background. A lot of pruning going on in this garden. And this is interesting, it, with the walk down under a beach uh, arbor, it's the trees train um, that you walk underneath with this gate. So. Um, and then finally, uh, Coosa Dogwood. This is pretty marginal in Vermont, but beautiful. Again, mid-June mid uh, related to the flowering dogwood. It's a variation, but again, with that kind of horizontal lines, more pointy white uh, flowers on it, but just a beautiful plant to see in bloom. They had quite a few of those there at Weathersfield. Sign me up for Innisfree. Um, as you know, <laughs> and we talk a lot about my interest in stone and some of those steps. Yeah. Uh, and I'm always struck when you bring in these pictures, the story behind the scene of the pruning and hedging that has to take place, the yeah. amount of work that, great stuff, Leonard. <laughs> um, you, you have plans to include these gardens in future trips, that's exactly. the point. Well, yeah, because yeah, basically what we do is we kind of alternate, we go east and west. So okay. last year we were Hudson Valley, this year we're going east over to coastal Maine, and so hopefully next year we'll go back to Hudson Valley. So you'll pick be in up Maine some of these. This is coastal Maine. So yeah, Maine we're going to Maine um, in August, early August. Gardens of coastal okay. Maine in New Hampshire. Um, that's the first week of August for three days. The coastal Maine Botanic Gardens is one of the top in New England now. It's just beautiful. I know I, when I went there, I spent about four or five hours. We're only going to have about three, but still, this is in June. It shows you with the peonies and, and such out. A beautiful, uh, intense area around near the Mr. Center and you can walk around here with water features and all kinds of plants and then we have uh, a slope in the back and you know we have all kinds of plantings mass plantings on that native plantings ferns and right down uh, it goes right native, down to, that's, that's classic Maine. Yeah, yeah, and it goes that's... right down to the water now, but we begin our tour at this place a lot of people know the proven winners proven selections plants this is where they come from this is a wholesale grower they have display gardens um, and it, it's a great stop and we'll be there right at their peak of these gardens so we'll get to see a lot of these new annual flower varieties and some perennials too but again just beautiful gardens gardens here at Pleasant View that we'll have on this tour this summer. Uh, we'll go to Portsmouth, we'll see, you know, Prescott Park, which is an All-America Selections Display Garden, which has new annual flowers like we have at, at Burlington Waterfront Park. So they're just a sampling of, you know, pictures of some of those. So you have a bunch of great sites, but, but that's not that's not all you do on these tours. No, we have a lot more, and yeah. uh, we, we actually see some more. In addition to the annual gardens, a Victorian rose garden. We'll have, um, of course, the Coastal Maine Botanic Gardens, the specialty gardens and greenhouses. We have several of those. Uh, of course, there'll be a lot of shopping, not only for garden goods, but we'll have, of course, Maine has some other good shopping. Coastal cuisine, we involve all of that. Uh, we'll be staying at a nice place in Portland. So, and of course, during the tour, we have a lot of uh, narration videos. Uh, Charlie Nardozzi, a lot of people know, will be along helping host this. So we, we're already about a third full this yeah. far out, so it fills quickly. Yeah. These and, and again, that's August 3rd Three, to the 5th. Yeah. And now I, I have a note here, a month earlier than that, on July 6th, you're headed up to Montreal. Right. Uh, we have just a day trip up to Montreal. Okay. We don't do these too often, but in the middle of summer, but we figured that would be a good time to see flowers like this, annual flowers, July 6th, again, just a day trip. And then uh, the Flowery Brook with all the uh, daylilies and so forth will be uh, in bloom. So that'll be good. So just a lot to see up there, roses, hopefully pretty much at peak bloom, Montreal 
in uh, July 6. And we were talking before we began today's program that that's not the only trip you're making to Montreal. No, uh, no we're making one this uh, fall. It'll be the first time we're okay. doing an overnight so people can see the Chinese lanterns okay. by day. Where can and night. folks get information on these on tours? On my website. Or? I've got uh, links for the two up already, and I'll have the other one coming up soon. So the perrysperennials.com. Check it out. I hope people can join us, All yeah, right. and, and get on there before they fill. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming in. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, really well, thank awesome. you, Will. We know you have choices, so we want to thank you for choosing us. I'm Will Michael, inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit across the fence.